tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 9, Episode 23. I'm your host, Otis Jari, and in this episode, I'll be performing five tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Ron Reiki, about malodorous medicine, terrible tricks, perilous passageways, antique antediluvians, and dangerous dentistry. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first four spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the tear, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail so lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Some monsters devour your guts. Some monsters devour your soul. Some monsters know just how to make you disappear just the right way. In our first story from Ron Reiki, be warned on what methods your doctors pick up from other places. Without further ado, I present to you, Just Like Me. God is in me, or else is not at all. Wallace Stevens. Not at all, I said. I don't mind doing this. In fact, I like it. The doctor left the room. Tiny dots, a Sunday afternoon in some nameless place, making tiny dots. You'd think X marks the spot, but we tend to prefer a circle, a ring. Think of surgery as a marriage, scalpel and body, a consummation, devoutly to be wished. You start with one dot, hold the marker for a second, and move to the next spot. For a while there, they banned markers, afraid they'd transfer bacteria from one patient to the next. But Sharpies, they found, have an alcohol-based solution, which kills germs, so it's very safe, no harm done. This is the fifth time I've done this. Well, the thousandth or so, if you count when I've done this professionally. But lately I prefer alternative medicine. And that's why I came to Guangzhou. They call it Gunzu, a mix of weaponry and zoology. The locals make exaggerated mafia claims. Truth is, I haven't seen a gun here once. Back in the States, I graduated from Emory. Trust me, I've seen guns in the ATL, but not in Guangzhou. I walk the alleys here, midnight, feel completely safe. The day I arrived, in fact, the newspaper cover was a photo of a man shot in the head by the police. He tried to rob a store with a handgun. The 
police sent a message. The newspaper sent an even bigger message. No guns here. Only safety for its people. I like that. I came initially to inspect, to see what it's like in a second world country, and was fascinated that the ambulances were empty, how little they seemed to be used. There were no medical supplies on board, just a bench, an uncomfortable bench. I sat in with a doctor for a day. He had a line outside of his office that never stopped. It got down to as few as seven, as many as fifty. He spent about a minute with each patient, maybe two. They'd come in, take off their shirt or pants, depending on where the pain was, and then slowly spin in a circle. Then he'd give a diagnosis, which, if my translation was correct, tended to be the avoidance of cold liquids. But what particularly intrigued me was the sheer capitalism. Anyone who says China is still a communist country is an idiot. China makes the U.S. look like Karl Marx runs it. China's discovery of free enterprise has been voracious. It's like they're thirsty for money. They want to catch up, to surpass, significantly. Similar to NYC nightclubs, patients could jump to the front of the line by simply slipping Yuan to the doctor's assistant. Then they could stay longer, ask more questions, get medicine, any medicine, with simple RMB. And I mean any medicine. The doctor had so much money by the end of the day that it filled a small bucket hidden to the side of his desk. He threw the money in it like it was meaningless, a garbage pail bank. The money, all untraceable, non-taxable. He told me the entire country of China was a republic of the untraceable. He asked me how many people were here. I said, a billion or so? More, he said. Isn't it 1.3 billion, to be exact? More, he said. Closer to 1.4? More, he said. I shrugged. Two billion, he said. He could tell it wasn't registering. The number too large. Uh, let me tell you something, the doctor said. Sit back. I followed his orders, and relaxed. About half the patients you've seen today, maybe more, they do not exist. Do you understand, do not exist? I nodded. They do not exist on paper. They exist in real life. Did you see them? His eyes were intent on me. I looked at his coat, the color of bones. 1.3 billion people? That's a joke. That is a very funny joke. Do you get the joke? No. Two billion, he said. One time, if you want, I'll take you to a town that does not exist. An entire town. Days later, he took me there, a three-hour drive. People who were not people who were people. We sat outside a house, a shack. It felt recycled, the sound of something chirping, a hum of chirping, almost electrical, constant, like a razor being operated. He told me that in China, anyone could disappear in a moment. He told me I could disappear. He said he could disappear and come back. He said that in China, everything is magic, including the medicine. I coughed. The cough had no echo, swallowed by the cicadas. I said, it feels like a ghost could be right there, right in front of us. He told me not to talk of ghosts. He said that in China, if you talk of ghosts, people start to wonder if you are a ghost. I'm not a ghost, I said. I coughed like someone sick. Someone who had a ghost life in the near future. Allergies, he said. He asked if I was drinking cold water. He told me nothing cold, ever again. At least when I was with him. I needed heat. He went in the shack. I heard talking, arguing, laughing, whispering. He came out and gave me a jar. Inside was something green and alive and dead and black. He insisted I swallow. First, he examined my tongue for the condition of the key. He said, your digestion is bad. Thickness on your tongue. Swallow. I swallowed. It tasted like barn. I'd just eaten earth. 
He took me to another house, a neighbor a mile away. We walked down an anorexic path that snaked like earthquake cracks. He said the walk would be good for me, that walking saves more lives than any pharmaceutical. He got to a house made of bamboo where there were no doors, and the sunset was such quickness that it scared me. The owner sat with us in the dark, never speaking. I wondered if he'd gotten up, left. He didn't seem to have a presence. Why are you here? asked the doctor. To learn. We sat in the falling dark, in a dark that didn't exist. I couldn't see. He told me a story about a boy who woke up without eyes. He told me of the woman who kidnapped him and drugged him. He said that when they first met, she said to the boy, You have nothing to worry about. I won't gouge your eyes out. When the child awoke, he couldn't see, because he only had sockets where his eyes had once been. He said that in China there are 1.5 million people needing transplants. He said they always need hearts and livers, kidneys and corneas. I tried to see him through the black. It seemed as if my own eyes were gone. Electricity didn't exist anymore, not here. I laid my neck upwards. The stars were white melanoma. If you ever had someone, he said, his voice trailing off, a pathway to nothing. Had someone? Someone who'd be honorable enough to give an organ. I tried to connect the dots to trace the Big Dipper. Kidneys, perhaps, he said, or heart. I wondered what animals were in China, what reptiles, what insects. I lifted my feet from the dirt, cradled my legs into my chest. We stared at the poem that is the sky for almost an hour. We stayed in that house for almost a week. Gave free exams. The doctor was like that. Kind, he gave free medicine. In exchange for stories. For meals. Rice and tongue. Rice and liver. Rice and ear. We returned to Guangzhou. I didn't return to the States. I stayed in China a long time. Long enough to make enemies. Five, to be exact. Four of them had very bad things happen to them. It's unfortunate what falls on people. The collapsing of life, the failure so common to the world. The New Testament is filled with mistakes. History is made of errors. I was assisting with one now. Dots. A person can go into surgery for one thing, but simple marker dots can be erased. Sanitizer, acetone, butter, simple water and salt. So many ways to erase. And then you can pick any new spot on the body. You can choose from a hundred different surgeries for the patient. A person can come in for a diverticulectomy and leave with a splenectomy. A tonsillectomy can, well, can become a cardiectomy. When you choose, it's smart to pick the common surgeries. Surgeries done every day. In the US, in Columbus, you might do one surgery in a day. In China, the doctors do five, 10, 20, 50. They get very good at it. They get much more practice than in the US. In China, they can do everything quickly, painlessly. So far, I've chosen an apodectomy, a cholecystectomy, a colectomy, and a hysterectomy. The doctor now calls me Tommy. He spells it T-O-M-Y. I'd tell you my real name, but I don't exist anymore. The doctor says I'm doing great things for the world, saving lives. The dots, I've noted, sometimes remind me of the stars in that town. I'd tell you the name of the town, but it doesn't exist. I'd tell you the name of the patient, but she doesn't exist. Soon she'll be a ghost, just like me. I hope you enjoyed Just Like Me by author Ron Reiki, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash reiki. That's simplyscarypodcast.com 
slash R-I-E-K-K-I. Ron is a prolific writer, poet, and occasional actor from the Great Lakes region, and the tales you hear tonight come from award-winning collections far and wide. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please leave Ron a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. A friend of mine once went into a hospital for a simple operation and came out a changed man. I mean that literally. The body they put his brain in does look a lot better, mind you. But those scars along the scalp line are a little unsightly. Oh, and I'm sure at some point in your life, you've met someone who's loved to pull all those simple parlor tricks on you. The removable thumb, the quarter behind the ear, pulling a dead cat out of a hat. Or maybe only I ever saw that last one. Anywho. In our second Ron Reiki story, we meet a young man and his wonderful old grandma, who shows us that sometimes those simple tricks can be lifesavers. Without further ado, I present to you, God Your Nose. I could almost smell trouble coming. They knocked and I went to the large front window in the living room to see who it was. I must have looked like the least possible threat ever, with my little five-year-old feet in bunny rabbit slippers with whiskers at the toes. He stood there, nose against the window glass, a man dressed in an optical illusion tie, its dizzying black and white pattern. His face was acne scarred. He held up a Bible, mouthing for me to unhook the main door latch. I went to the door, startled to see another man, watching me through its tiny window. He was perfectly bald and gave me a pleasant nod as I reached for the knob. I tested to see if it was locked. It was. I stepped back and he frowned. He thought I was going to open it. I'm not alone, I said loud enough so he could hear through the glass. We've been watching you, said the man. The other came to the front door. You were playing video games and got some cheese from the refrigerator, said the other. We've been watching you, said the man. We've got eyes, said the bald one. My body was on fire from all the lights on in the house and from the fast pace of my heart. Outside, the entire place must have glowed. I was afraid of the dark. I believed in monsters, and they were in front of me now. You can't come in. Oh, yes, we can said the voice through the door. They took a rock from the yard and smashed in the front window. I ran upstairs. I had three rooms to choose from. Two bedrooms and a bathroom. I chose to hide in my bedroom simply because I knew it well. It was perhaps a bad choice. They were in the doorway in seconds, like two great witches, shadows in a world of brightness. I rushed to my window, opened it, and leaped. I hovered there, choked by my shirt, suffocating in midair. One of them had grabbed me. The other one's hands seemed to run over the entirety of my body. They thrust me into the room and threw me onto my magic wand and star's bedsheets. My feet were bound before I realized it, the tape so tight, I felt sick, as if my circulation was stifled. It was. Put your hands out, said the man. I pushed myself up and put my head on the pillow. He's making himself comfortable. I noticed the knife. It was our knife. They took it from the kitchen. I'd eaten hundreds of meals served to me with that knife. It had cut almost every slab of meat. You should know, I said, that soon my grandpa is going to be here. He stabbed the knife into my bed. The knife stood there, perfect posture, as if it was meant to be there all along, inches from my feet. You hear that? His grandpa's going to be here, said the man. Well, how old's your grandpa? I don't know, I said. Is he this old? Said the man, holding up all his fingers. More, I said. Is he in his nineties? Said the bald man. 
He has more hair than you, I said. Well, said the bald man, I think we can handle ourselves with a mouthy little boy and a dying 90-year-old. He was in the war, I said. They laughed brutally, a slaughterhouse of laughter, something very pig-like and cadaverous about it, and wondered what they'd do to me. He threw the knife from the bed. That wasn't nice, said Grandpa from the hallway. This frightened the both of them. The one with the knife held it out, giving an empty swipe at the air. My grandfather walked into the room and touched where the bed was bleeding feathers. Are you teasing my boy, said Grandpa. The ugly laughter returned, a conveyor belt of sniggering. How'd you like it if I were to tease you, said Grandpa. We're going to take every cent of money you have in the place, said the bald man. He smiled, a gummy smile. You mean like this, said Grandpa, and he reached to the man's ear, and before he could react, pulled out a quarter. He held it out for the man. He knocked it out of Grandpa's hand. Let me tell you something, Grandpa, said the man. We're going to cut you and your little boy into microscopic pieces and scatter every one of your body parts all across your front lawn for all the neighbors to see. They were microscopic, the neighbors won't be able to see, said Grandpa. He shoved Grandpa, causing him to fall into the hallway wall. My view was partially blocked, but I saw Grandpa reach forward and grab at the man's face, pinching his nose. What are you doing, you idiot, said the man. I stole your nose, said Grandpa. This was a game he did with me. He'd form a fist and make his thumb protrude between his middle and index finger. The thumb supposedly looking like you had the person's nose. The man said, Well, I'm going to saw your nose off. The bald man stopped in his tracks, staring at the man's face. Why are you looking at me like that? asked the man. How'd you do that? said the bald man. Do what? Do you want me to put it back? asked Grandpa. Yes, begged the bald man. Grandpa pushed his hand onto the man's face. The man swiped the knife at Grandpa, who stepped out of its reach. How'd you do that? said the bald man again. Do what? said the man. He took your nose off. He didn't take my nose off, you mumbling moron. He just went like this. The man attempted to place his fingers like you do in the game. No, said the bald man. He took your nose completely off. Like this, said Grandpa, and he snatched at the man's face again. There, yelled the bald man. My nose is still. But before the man could finish his sentence, the bald man pulled him to my bedroom mirror, where it was indisputable that he no longer had a nose on his face. The man patted at the nothingness that was there now. He must have put some sort of covering over it. Can you smell? The man tried to smell, but he had no nose. Grandpa held out his hand. An object like a nose was in his palm. The man shoved the knife at Grandpa. You shouldn't tease like that, said Grandpa. I'll tease you all right. I'll cut your real nose off both of your real faces. Put the knife down, said Grandpa. Or you'll do what? With that, Grandpa reached forward and took off the man's arm. He went to the window and threw the arm out. Do you want me to throw the rest of you out of the house as well, said Grandpa? You must be more polite. There are rules. The men looked flush with panic and confusion. Are you in on this with him, said the bald man. It feels like my arm's actually gone, said the man. You never told me you had a fake arm. It's called a prosthetic, said Grandpa. I don't have a fake arm. I have a real arm, said the man. Well, then how did he throw it out into the bushes? Give me my arm back, said the man. Are you going to behave? No, we're not going to behave. We're going to... The man didn't know what to threaten us with. He no longer had a knife. That was outside in the bushes with the arm. What are you going to do, said Grandpa. The bald man reached to see if the man's arm was there. It wasn't. It seemed to anger him. Where's the money, said the bald man. What money? Money in the house, the jewelry, said the bald man. Don't raise your voice. 
I'll do anything I want, said the bald man. Grandpa leaned over and took off the man's head. He threw it out the window. The head rolled onto the middle of the lawn. We heard it yell, Marty! Apparently it was the man's name in the room. Marty stared at the headless body of his friend. A part of the man wanted to try to attack my grandfather, but a more intelligent part won out. Timothy said, Can I please have my nose back? Please? You still going to kill me and kill my grandson? Said Grandpa. Uh, no, sir, said the man. I'm sorry about that, sir. You're sorry that you were planning on killing a family and stealing their money. Yes, sir, I know it sounds horrible. Sounds, said Grandpa, and he threw the nose out the window. The headless man's body took a step forward. Marty screamed and, gripping his Bible, ran out into the hall, down the steps, and out of the house. We could hear the man below searching for his nose. The headless body just stood there. He's very polite now, I said. So quiet, said Grandpa. Yes, I said. Was he uh, always this quiet? No, I said. He was much more talkative when he had his head. He probably misses it, said Grandpa. I hopped up. Grandpa noticed my feet were still taped together. He also noticed the tape on the floor. He picked it up, sat on the bed, and bound his own feet. This was a good game, said Grandpa. He hopped around the room. I joined him in hopping with him. The headless body just stood there, unable to watch us. I hope you enjoyed Got Your Nose by author Ron Reiki as performed by yours truly. My neighbor's version of that game is a bit more crude than the one we just heard. She plays your nose as well with some of her gentleman callers, but usually it involves a circular saw and a lot of paper towels. Ron Reiki brings us back to the darker side of China in his third story of the evening, but this one has nothing to do with medicine. No, perhaps this could be considered more of a cautionary tale of losing oneself in a world of exotic delights. Delights that you might not recognize as trouble until it is too late. Without further ado, I present to you Stairwell. I sat watching the girls walk by. This was my second week in Shanghai, my first time in Asia. The girls looked like they were heading to funerals. Their expressions, their clothing... Their entire demeanor screamed death to me. I'd come from Montreal, where there was an equal affinity for black, but the vibe was still catwalk. Montreal felt like runway. Shanghai felt like runaway. Maybe it was simply because I didn't understand the culture. I was thoroughly Canadian. I grew up in Sudbury, which got me used to the air pollution, the way that the sky can look like artistic renditions of lung cancer, beautiful gray carcinoma mornings. The boss told me to get out of the office. He said my hyperactivity would scare the clients. He said I didn't know how to shut up. The Chinese like silence. The first person to talk loses. He told me to roam the streets. A Chinese co-worker warned me of the three hands. The three hands, what's that? He put his hand in my pocket, took it away. I was dumbfounded. I went back and asked my boss what it meant. My boss was German-Japanese. He was perfectly fluent in Chinese, but his hints of Japanese background put him at a loss with Chinese clients. Due to histories of war, many Chinese hate the Japanese. It's a subtle subtext, sometimes not subtle. I asked the boss what three hands meant. He told me to get out of his office or I'd be fired. The makeup company was almost there. It was all female clients, all Chinese. They would hate a jabbermouth male American. I was being paid to get lost. I left. I went down the stairwell. A 
the very last step, I heard my boss yell from a window, Pickpockets! Shanghai swallowed me immediately. The city is hungry for foreigners, starved from its days of isolationism. China's schizophrenic with other cultures. The Beijing government has called for bans of foreign words in the media. CCTV news anchors fined for saying iPhone or NBA. Comically, the term CCTV uses the alphabet, not Chinese characters. Its culture of contradictions in the streets show it. The Dalai Lama is banned from the country, but it's amazing how many of the people look like His Holiness. I headed for the temple only because it's the center of all my directions. If I went in any other direction, the risk would be disappearance from the earth itself. Co-workers told me the temple has the power of Feng Shui. They told me I should go there as often as possible, so I have been. Never going inside, I never had the money to do that. I merely walked by and watched the circus outside. The strange show of multiple amputee beggars and monks walking with basketballs and people standing in a line that never seems to move. I touch my hand on the temple the way that a child walks with her hand touching the fence. Nearby or prostitution massage parlors and Indonesian restaurants. A dentist is in the alley doing work on someone's teeth the way you would go to a backstreet mechanic. His tools look like they've never been cleaned since the beginning of the Zha dynasty. I could go back to my apartment, but during the day, the old man in the apartment next to mine smokes constantly. During work hours, it's not a problem, but on the weekends, I find that I have to wander the streets until night when I can breathe again. I'm used to this, the feeling of homelessness, directionless. The craving for China came from a fantasy of meditation and acupuncture. I thought I would turn into a Genjin, a life of worship and revelation. For a city of over 20 million people, I was amazed at the boredom. From a moving crowd, a woman approached. She took my arm. She was skeletal, looking like she'd just gotten out of her deathbed. The makeup caked on her bones. She had an intensity that I unwisely allowed myself to feel. I gave way to her pull. She led me down an alley. It felt very Epcot, something so Disney and facade about it. The hanging laundry, the background actors and windows, making two-second cameos. She took me into a garage. There was a car the color of rice without any wheels. I wondered if I was going to my own murder. I didn't seem to mind. At the back of the garage, she pressed a button. Elevator doors opened. She pulled me in. Her neck, her face resembled a chimney, the soot of her hair. Her excitement rose when she realized I'd actually followed her inside. The doors closed. She looked at my feet. She looked at my head. She looked at my feet again. She said something in Chinese, put her hand in the air to show how impressed she was with my height. I wonder if she was going to sell me. I wonder if she was attracted to me. I wondered if this was her job. The doors opened. We were on the fifth floor. The inside of the building was a maze. A restaurant to the left with a plate of what looked like deep-fried honeybees. She took me to the right by a row of pool tables problematically plays too close to each other. To play a game, you had to wrestle for space. We walked by a room filled with women just standing there, waiting, dressed in something similar to airline stewardess uniforms, miniskirts. They waved to me, all of them. I waved back. She took me down a hall, or not down. There was only straight. Everything so flat and cramped together. China is not a place for the claustrophobic. Claustro doesn't come from closet. It comes from locking or bolting. The feel that someone has a key and they have you trapped in a space. You need the key. And she had the key. I followed. We got to a room filled with rooms, all black. The light bulbs gave a prison feel, poverty to the air. The entire walk, 
be one I knew I was her possession. The authority with which she led me, the safety of that. She opened the door and pushed me inside and closed the door. I was alone. The safety was gone. Two men sat immobile, one Chinese, one Japanese. The difference in ethnicity was apparent now. The distinction's clear. They were barely dressed, staring at each other. The door opened. My woman walked in. She had a girl with her, about 15, completely obedient, frightened in her face, eyes to the ground, lipstick on her like blood. She leaned into me, and there was a sensual shock to my system that I was completely uncomfortable with. She whispered in broken English that the two men were involved in a staring match. And, I said, she kept her eyes to the ground. Why am I here, I said. Watch. I looked at the woman who led me here. She looked incredibly pleased that I had made the journey, that I would witness whatever was in front of me. The two men stared deep into each other's eyes. Do you have any questions? The girl whispered. Thousands. I whispered back. We should not talk much, she said. Why do they do this, I asked. She put her head down lower. I couldn't see her eyes. The men's ribs poked through their chest, faces locking fat. How long? I whispered. Years, she said. Years? Many. How many? She looked away. The woman motioned for us to stop talking, for us to watch. I noticed they weren't staring directly at each other. I tried to measure their exact place of eyesight, there wasn't an exact point being fixated on. How do you win? I whispered. Win? She whispered back. The woman took the girl by the arm and led her out. The door closed, but I didn't hear it. I looked back and they were gone. The smell was of faint urine. A gentle bamboo incense, skin, something like vinegar or flowers. Opiate-like. The lack of sound alarmed me pool tables, the girls, the restaurant, the honeybees. None could be heard. I stared at the men, staring. The beauty was in the human act of living. And the fear, the danger, the insanity, the religion, the godliness and the godlessness of it. I found myself unable to look away. I sat as they sat, a third I looked in the center of us, where we would meet in the middle of the newly formed triangle. Part of me sensed that their eyes shifted as well, took on this new spot, this nothingness between us. And for the first time I could see it. Nothing. So clearly visible. I could see the air, the molecules, the dust, the argon, the nuclei. My body locked. Time faded. I could sense my bones changing, that shadows would come into the room, whisper and leave. I could sense that a fourth person was at it, years later, perhaps a fifth. Someone fed me, someone cleaned me, brief, tender, the clothing scissored off. A beard, a sixth, a seventh, until eventually no one. There was only breath. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by June's Journey. The thrill of the holiday season can be a joyous but stressful time. I find myself yearning for a lot more downtime than usual this month. That doesn't mean I get it, mind you. <laughs> but the point remains the same. Well, I'll tell you a secret. One of the reasons why is that I found a new game from Wooga that I'm absolutely smitten with. I get to put on my inner detective hat and focus on drama and stress that isn't my own. There are so many games available in your play stores, and I think I've found just the perfect one to get some mental silence and exercise during the hustle and bustle. It's a captivating game by our friends at Wooga called June's Journey. It's a murder mystery slash hidden object game 
set back in the 20s with all the era's charm and aesthetic. You and I play the part of June Parker, amateur detective investigating the death of her sister. It's free to download, beautifully designed, and at times I have a hard time putting my phone down. It's that enjoyable. June's journey will unleash your inner P.I. while you explore intricate scenes around the world and collect evidence to solve mysteries. Gameplay is engaging and gratifying. Not to mention, you'll be using your mind quite a bit, too. No mindless screen time here, folks. And what's more is the mysteries are ever-evolving. New cases and scenery are added each week, meaning you'll always have a fresh case to dive into. I love to play in the morning, when most of the world is still asleep. Then I'll play again, but in reverse, to wind down after a long day. Hell, sometimes, I've even found myself popping it open during the middle of the day. All right, I'll admit it. Sometimes I deliberately sneak away to play. The thing is, friends, when you're a detective, you're a detective. It's my great mission to investigate, meaning June's journey has become my journey. I hope it'll become yours, too. So why wait? Put your powers of observation to the test and join the rapidly growing community of over 30 million June's Journey fans. Escape to a glamorous, often forgotten era of danger, elegance, mystery, and romance. Take it from me, it's the bee's knees and the cat's pajamas all rolled into one. Ready to awaken your inner detective? Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. I hope you enjoyed Stairwell by author Ron Reiki, as performed by yours truly. I wonder if he's still sitting there to this day, staring at nothing, not even noticing the world go by. Oh, I I'm not talking about the fellow in our last story. I'm thinking of the average internet junkie. Speaking of the world going by, it never seems we have enough years to do all we want. But even if we had the health and the money, what would we do with all those extra years? Maybe a quick glimpse inside a rest home for the very, very, very aged in our fourth Ron Reiki story may change your mind. Without further ado, I present to you Special Patient Populations. For the fourth building of Florida's Leesburg Super Geriatric Regional Medical Center, you have to go through a series of doors that require a badge, computerized vein recognition, and facial recognition from the security guard. An overhanging sign greets you with the words, Cogito ergo sum. The weak evening winter sun insists its way through the tinted windows of February. Valentine's Day hearts line the walls of an area where 10% of the people have had acute myocardial infarction. This is Wing B, the 100-year-olds. I spent 20 years here. This is my first day cleared for all wings. I'm sick of 175-year-olds who are sick of sickness. I'm curious as hell in heaven and purgatory to see what the 200-year-olds look like, but I'm not rushing there. It's important that the panoptic security cameras see me acting nice bored. What the hell kind of world is it where the death of a super wealthy 150-year-old is a premature burial? Benjamin is still unable to get out of her bedless bed. She hovers there, weightless, floating, a brilliant cure for decubitus ulcers. You need gravity for bed sores. All of the people in this building are millionaires. But the buildings I'm about to go to, billionaires. The final room houses a trillionaire, but one step at a time. I heard the gaggle of Ronsi, the crash of crackles, the stampede of rails, the entire animal kingdom of horrible breath sounds that are part of this wing. I imagine wing C is the sound of death, 
except death has been cured, if you can afford it. So I'm wondering if the sound is peace, which, in many ways, is the same as death. All we've created, truly, is a heck of a lot more pain. And what's that really done is made pharmaceutical billionaires. The irony that the bulk of the people in these buildings are ex-pharmacy CEOs. They spent their life selling meds so that they could afford an eternity of life on meds. If anyone knew my thoughts, I'd be burned at the stake. Actually, burned before the stake. I'd be burned in a hallway, in my office, in the elevator, wherever the thoughts were discovered. But I have a poker face, mostly because I have a poker heart. I'm the perfect combination of pleasant and could care less that all hospitals require. I go down the hallway with hellos to blind people who can't see I'm waving, and happy VD Day to a woman I know who has three venereal diseases. They haven't cured blindness or herpes yet, but death has been mastered. Medicine ends with sin, and it begins with me. I make a lot. I mean... All of the pennies I've earned could stack from here to the recently discovered 11th planet, Vesta. In my old age, I probably won't be able to afford Wing B, but I'll spend some years in Wing A. Then I'll die like a man, like a woman, like a tree. I die like everything dies, solemnly and stupidly. This is rocking chair land. I walk by people who can't walk. The rooms go in order of age. I'm in the 190s now. I can see the final door here coming up, and walking through it, I feel like I have a planet named after me. The Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Ceres, Vesta, and Bob. The hallway between Wing B and Wing C is the color of breasts, multicultural white and brown and black with pink in the center. I've heard that there are hints at sexuality in the rooms, subliminal sounds of orgasms in the pumped-in music. Of course, until this moment, it's all been rumor, but I'm about to find out the truth about these rooms. The badge clicks. The vein scan flatlines. That's a good sign. The security person, wonderfully androgynous, shakes its head yes, and I can go on. And I do. This will be my first 200-year-old person on the other side of that door. I open it, and I notice the hallway is smaller, less rooms. The doors are all closed. This disappoints. In Wing A, the feel is of a very depressing, mad party, but a party nonetheless. You're guaranteed some nudity, some vomiting, some laughter, something inexplicable every day. Just yesterday, a man peed all over his roommate. The roommate, come to find out, had requested it. His skin was on fire. I told him we have medicine for dysesthesia, but he said the urination works better. Truth is, he's probably right. Urine is still used in some hospitals for jellyfish things. But this is the 200s, where, apparently... Billionaires want privacy. I slow my walk. I hope the camera views this as reverence on my part. I'm part janitor, part assistant, part EMT, part father figure, part uncle figure, part cop, part nurse, part Moses, part everything. I carry a stethoscope and a mop, although I keep the mop folded up, tucked away. I put the stethoscope out proudly. Hospitals are all about performance. Everyone who works in a hospital is dressed in his or her specific Halloween costume, playing nurse or surgeon or mortician. It's the same as a witch or a vampire or a zombie costume. We aren't those things. We just pretend. For money. A lot of money. You work your whole life to give us your money in the end. Our money. I get to the end, and door after door is closed. The rooms are even more soundproof. From one, I swear, I hear the gospel of Jesus Christ performed as punk rock. 
from another, I was unsure if it was porn or a game show. I click through the door and get into another hallway. This one has a floor the color of dollar bills, walls the color of quarters, and a ceiling the color of sky with little stars of 24 karat gold. Wing D. These are the 300 year old. There are oval portraits of the residents on the walls. They look like hollow sockets. They look like child skeletons, so shrunken in their old age that they've turned into rigor mortis fetuses. They look desperate for light. I walk by them, their eyes and chins and necks following me. When you get to be that age, everyone looks like they belong in a haunted house, not a nursing home, for the ubered moneyed. I click, I'm okay, and wait through. I walk like Christ on linoleum. Inside the hall is even shorter. The doors are closed, but not all. Towards the end, a few are opened. A person is wheeled out of a room at the end. I watch from a distance. The wheelchair is pure silver, motorized. Three women are behind him, not pushing, but accompanying him. They're dressed respectfully as a nun, a pixie, and a dominatrix. He wheels into another room, or perhaps it's a she. The person is controlling everything with perhaps its eyes. I slow, I take it in. I'm also nervous, I smile harshly. I'm ignored. I see that rooms are open and empty. I see that they're filled with the most obscure of things. One room is filled with wine, a cabinet with bottle after bottle stacked to the ceiling, casks of sherry, fino, oloroso, amontillado. Another room is a complex doll collection of all sizes, shapes, scents, feet, faces, some feeling human, real, others as if they'd been collected from Bali, Tanzania, Far reaches, singular creations, ruby eyes, silk clothes. One of the dolls stands up and walks to the door and closes it. I have what the French call chicken skin, goosebumps. I feel like I'm being watched by cameras and ghosts and tables. I walk more quickly. I start realizing the reason for the extreme security. The level of dementia must be extreme. The amount of money at their disposal, even more extreme. The last room seems to have everyone in it, everyone from the other rooms. It's palace-like, a house of a room. The door is wide open. The door has its tongue out for the doctors. A red carpet that glistens with expense. I look forward. An exaggeratedly large camera, unnecessarily large is mounted on the wall opposite the room. The camera moves loudly, a speaker system set up so that you can actually hear it moving. It follows me. I don't look inside, only peripheral vision. I go through the door to Wing E. Wing E for people over 400 years old. I've heard there are only a dozen or so of them here. The hall is even shorter and smaller. The thing is in the chair the moment I walk in. A mummy. Alive. A face like hop frog. Its body like a purloined letter. An Edgar Allan Poe theme. The feel that it has no eyes. The mouth in perfect O. It speaks to me. A nurse rushes out of the room. He's panicked. Apologetic. He translates. The thing is talking through a computer system. Unintelligible to me. You need practice, the nurse says, except Miss Cunningham speaks with an Oxfordian vocabulary, so you'll have to pay a bit of extra special attention. I listen. The sounds make no sense. My senses barely hear any sound. I lean in. I smile like my life depends on it. It does. Mrs. Cunningham could order my death on a whim if she wanted to, if she lacked ethics, if the wind pushed her that way. The nurse tells me that Mrs. Cunningham had a dream last night, that she could knock on the sky, that the sky was made out of lead. 
I shake my head yes. The nurse asks me if I understand the god metaphor. I nod yes. The nurse tells me that Mrs. Cunningham thinks I'm smarter than her. I say no, that could never be the case. The nurse says that Mrs. Cunningham wants to know if I believe in God. I choke on the future. This is why I'm paid so much. For moments like these, one wrong word and I'll wear my vertebrae on the outside. I pause, thinking, performing that she is brilliant to ask this question. Mrs. Cunningham closes her eyes that aren't there and falls asleep. I thank God for that. The nurse tells me I should go. I almost run. Other doors are open. The people seem to be wearing clown wigs. Their faces seem either smashed together and shrunken or elongated from torture racks. A few have mega plastic surgeries where one feels they're looking at corpse ghosts or skeletal lions. They have rock skin. There's never any movement, or if there is, it's so minute as to almost be unnoticeable. I've surprised them. They aren't lined up to watch me. They look out windows at fake worlds, trees created for them, lawns crafted to childhood dreams. It's Disney facade. I see an oxygen tank that's painted to look like jungle ferns. There are more hover beds, entertainment systems with three-dimensional perfection in that double as x-ray machines. One room is a church. A Jesus animatronic is on a cross. The hymn playing feels planetarium celestial. If one closed their eyes, you could imagine you were at the highest reaches of Dante's hierarchy. I leave wing E. Wing F is the 500-year-olds, 600-year-olds, and 700-year-olds. The doors are open. The rooms are empty but only because they lead to other rooms. These are hospital rooms as mansions. They lead into underground cities they own. There appears to be no cameras anymore. There are six people in this wing. I have a feeling I'll never see them. Or if I do, it'll be like Haley's Comet, brief but unforgettable. I get to the final hall, the final door. The final badge check full body scan, a repeat of the full body scan, and a Navy SEAL team that gives me a series of questions. The SEAL team leader says he'll be accompanying me from this point on. He tells me I'll have to leave the mop behind. We enter Wing G. Wing G is the trillionaire 800-year-old. Single, not plural. One. There is no hall. We step outside. We're not outside, says the seal. So don't think you are. I look up at the endless sky. It's not endless, says the seal. Are you real? I ask. He listens on an earpiece. I touch a tree. It feels like a real tree. I feel the sun. It must be the real sun. It must be. The seal finishes listening. He says to me, she wants to know what you want. I shake my head negatively, instinctively. I don't need anything. I have this. I have experienced this. No, says the seal, lowering his voice. When she offers you whatever you want, you should take that opportunity. What do you mean? He leans into me and whispers, Whatever you want, you'll have. You just need to say it now. This is why I'm paid to do this job. My life, my happiness, my death, his death, her death, the life of every living thing, the world relies on what I say. I look up at the sun, that is not a sun, but is the sun, and I let it blind me with its first full of orange in order to be left only with my infinite possibility of words. I hope you enjoyed Special Patient Populations by author Ron Reiki, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website, 
Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Reiki. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash R-I-E-K-K-I. Be sure to not only peruse his many anthologized and award-winning writings, but also his poetry, his acting roles, and his non-fictional work as well. As a reminder, if you decide to give any of this talented author's stories a read, please consider leaving them a quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote, and be sure to let them know you heard about them on this program and that Otis sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm pretty sure Ron would much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and add free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Ha ha ha!